All right. Well, I guess uh, I'm trying to be fairly punctual with Zoom events so we can um, get started. Uh, I am so, so happy to be able to have Sam here for this lecture. Um, as uh, those of you who don't know, but probably have figured it out by now, um, Sam is married to my sister, Leora. And therefore, um, amongst many under what, well, I guess I don't get to see you that often because of the whole Israel plus COVID thing. But um, through Facebook, I've been getting quite a lens into all of the really interesting um, research that Sam has been doing. And I'm not gonna try to summarize it. I'll let him do that. Um, but I thought any time that people of a religion sort of engage in practices that are purely objectively speaking, would qualify as a uh, religious contradiction, let's say. I know that's a sensitive way of framing it. Um, I just find it absolutely like a fascinating psychological um, insight just into how people function and that this topic is certainly a great example of that. Um, and we wanted to, to hold off on the lecture so that we could time it with a Parsha that doesn't address specifically like necromance seems well, and you'll talk more about that also, um, but certainly says, you know, you are not allowed to have magic in your midst, essentially, right? And it's such an explicit law. And yet here's an, a real life example of people who dabbled in frankly the opposite. Um, and so I'm thrilled that Sam has chosen such an awesome topic to research for his PhD and that he is here to share it with us. Um, and also thrilled to have so many people from all over the world joining us. Thank you so much. Um, I don't like to do formal introductions of me just like reading his bio off a page. Um, so Sam, I'll let you just say a word about yourself um, in a more authentic way, but thank you so much for being here. Um, you have screen sharing ability, so I'm gonna mute myself. And if there's anything else you need, let me know. And it is, as you can see, it is being recorded. Um, so uh, don't do anything too crazy out there and uh, we'll share the recording afterwards. Okay. Uh, thank you very much to Mara Ruth for the uh, invitation and introduction. I am going to, at this juncture, mute everyone else. Um, make sure that this is, okay, excellent. Um, so I just want to, again, thank Mara Ruth for the, uh, for the introduction and the opportunity to share some of my uh, research with a broader audience. Um, just um, a word about myself. Um, I am writing a PhD in the Department of Jewish Thought at Ben Gurion University in Beersheba in Israel on the Eastern European Jews and what was, was called the occult, which is a word that some people are familiar with, but not everyone. And the word occult or occultism in the modern context is used to refer to a whole range of uh, practices and beliefs that, um, all have in common a concern with engagement with um, what are believed to be hidden uh, dimensions of reality, whether these are hidden forces, uh, hidden knowledge, um, hidden parts of the self. And another thing they have in common is that occult ideas are often articulated or expressed in a more um, scientific or at least scientific sounding language. So examples would be, you know, um, telepathy, astrology, things like that. Um, and one uh, very significant occult current, perhaps one of the most prominent occult currents was what is known as spiritualism. Um, just to briefly out what I'm going to be sharing today, I'm going to briefly uh, just give a brief historical introduction to the spiritualist movement in general, uh, for those who are not familiar. Um, then I will present several case studies of Jewish engagement uh, with spiritualism, whether it's actual practice or whether um, just discussing it as a, as a concept or, or um, rabbinic debates about whether it's permitted or not for a Jew to participate in spiritualism and, and to um, conduct a seance or be a part of a seance. Um, and so I think... Uh, it's time for me to share my screen. Okay, um, just as an introduction, already from the get-go, the background image uh, of this first slide is a uh, from a seance of uh, Jewish participants in England um, from the early 1930s. Um, and the figure in the back with the glasses sort of looking 
in the back in the middle with the glasses looking sideways is a famous Jewish spiritualist named Maurice Barbonell. But I'll get to that uh, further on. Um, so the origins of spiritualism is actually very funny. Spiritualism, at least if you ask a spiritualist, can be dated very precisely uh, to the Hydesville wrappings of March 31st, 1848. Um, what occurred then was that uh, three sisters who are pictured here on, on the right, Leah, Maggie, and Kate Fox, claimed to hear mysterious rapping sounds in the basement of their family's home in Hydesville, New York, uh, which Hydesville today no longer exists, but it is in upstate New York. Um, and investigating the phenomenon, they came to the conclusion that the wrappings were, um, the, the wrappings were, their origin was the spirit of a man who had previously been murdered and his body buried uh, in the basement of their house. And he was producing rapping sounds in order to communicate uh, with those present. And they, they developed a system, sort of a, a way of a certain number of raps is yes, you know, a certain number of raps is no. And they were able to develop a system for uh, communicating with the spirit. Um, word of this reached the media, uh, you know, whatever media there was in the mid 19th century, newspapers, et cetera. And the idea of spiritualism spread like wildfire all over the US. Um, an important point was that Hydesville is very close to Seneca Falls. Uh, the Seneca Falls Convention was an, an important uh, turning point in uh, early American feminism. It took place several months later in, uh, I believe, July 1848. And there are, were very close ties between the spiritualist movement and early feminism, um, particularly in the US. Um, is one aspect of spiritualism is that um, the person at the center uh, of you know uh, of, of of all the action, the person, the medium who is conveying uh, communication from the spirits was almost always a woman. Uh, so spiritualism was provided a platform for women to have a more prominent voice uh, than they often did at that time in the U.S. Uh, the connection between spiritualism and feminism, while very strong at the beginning in the U.S., um, is sort of uh, weakens over the passage of time. And also, spiritualism spreads internationally and is not really uh, as much a factor in Jewish uh, spiritualism, but it is important to mention in any case. Um, one aspect of spiritualism is that it sort of is a practice that falls in between science and religion, much like uh, other occult phenomena as well, in that you have something that is very um, numinous or related to the spirit world or to religious questions and that you're able to uh, communicate with uh, the spirits of the dead but it doesn't necessarily claim allegiance to any particular religious movement or make uh, religious claims upon its followers or dictate practices. Um, yes, yeah, so I also mentioned this was a language of technology that spiritualism often will refer, you know, spiritualists will refer to the spirits of the dead in the language of initially of a telegraph and then as radio is developed, they start speaking about radio waves. Um, so that's another important factor as well. Um, so if something I hadn't made clear to know, how is spiritualism practice? What did spiritualism look like? Um, spiritualism basically um, consisted of, of what are called seances, which were gatherings, uh, social gatherings, whether private uh, or public, in which a person known as the medium would uh, convey communication from spirits of the dead, whether spirits who are believed to be present in the room or otherwise um, accessed from the other world. Uh, a central part of sort of the layout of a seance was the table. Um, there are very few records of seances, almost no records I, I've found of seances that do not involve a table. Um, people gather on the table. Um, and as you can see this picture here on the, on the right, this is a picture of a seance held in Warsaw in the 1920s with the famous Polish medium, Jan Guzik, um, who's located in um, the middle of the high back chair. Um, and one thing you can notice about the picture is that while there are more women than men present around the table, uh, for where there are men there, the men and women are seated interspersed, man, woman, man, woman, which was another part of the seance protocol was that men and women uh, were believed to have positive and negative electric charges 
and therefore you had to have them equally interspersed um, in order to successfully access the spirit realm. And this is another example of where spiritualists employ um, technological language, that scientific language that was then becoming more well known, if not well understood um, by large numbers of people. Uh, spiritualists also develop different uh, technological devices, different devices uh, for communicating with spirits. On the top right, uh, I have a picture of an advertisement for a planchette. A planchette uh, sort of as the predecessor of the Ouija board was a uh, three-legged almost stool of sorts that would be placed on top of a large sheet of paper and it would facilitate um, automatic writing on the part of the medium or others present and that you would lay your hand on top of the planchette and let the spirits direct the movement of your hand and then afterwards you'd have to decipher whatever writing was there. Um, another important point that I'll, I'll come up from my examples is that the, uh, the seance table was classically described as not containing any nails, as that would interfere with the, as the spiritualist would claim that nails on the table would interfere with the electromagnetic um, charge of the spirits. That's their claim. Um, now I want to uh, mention in, in brief um, the um, biblical attitude towards uh, communication with the spirits of the dead. Um, the sort of the starting point um, uh, for all this, and this is where I'm going to leave it now, is the verse in Sefer Dvarim in, in the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, it says, let no one be found among you who consigns his son or daughter to the fire, or who is an augur, a soothsayer, a diviner, a sorcerer, one who casts spells, or who consults ghosts, that's an ov, or familiar spirits, yidoni, or who inquires of the dead. So the verse here seems to very explicitly prohibit, um, first of all, at the end of the verse, doresh el hametim, someone who inquires of the dead, and also these uh, professions or uh, practitioners of something called ov and yidoni, uh, which is not quite uh, clear what that means, but is generally understood by uh, rabbinic and later commentators to refer to specific practices of necromancy uh, for communicating with the dead. Um, and so uh, at first glance, this would seem to prohibit participation in spiritualism for, you know, for those who uh, subscribe to the Torah, which would certainly be, you know, traditional uh, followers of Judaism. Um, yet, as I hope to show now, spiritualist practice spread widely, not only among more secular or assimilated Jews, but also among traditional Jews in the religious heart, uh, heartland of Eastern Europe. Um, so I would now like to turn to uh, spiritualism in modern Jewish history by starting with a telling a story set in Eastern Europe in a shtetl called Rozvodov. This story takes place in around 1870. It is a, I, 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 I wouldn't, I, I can't guarantee it is a true story, but I can tell you that the story is being, the person who told the story told the story as a true story. Um, so if we accept the testimony of the person telling the story, then this is a true story that took place um, around the year 1870. Um, the story begins, it was in the Shabbos chamber of the Rosvadova Rebbe. So the Rosvadova Rebbe was a, was a Hasidic rabbi. He's a historic figure, we know his name, uh, who lived in the shtetl of, of Rosvadov. And as part of his duties as a Hasidic Rebbe, he had a special room, uh, the Shabbos uh, chamber, a special room where he would hold gatherings with his Hasidim, what is, in, in, is known in, in Yiddish as a tish. A uh, tish in Yiddish is a table. He would hold gatherings around the table with his Hasidim, with his followers, um, every Shabbos, every Shabbat. Um, so these, the protagonist of the story, the story takes place in the Shabbos chamber of this Rebbe, although not on Shabbos, the Rebbe is not there. Um, the story continues, a broad, heavy oak table stood there that required four hardy peasants to move it. The rumors concerning the hidden powers of table turning, in which the table uttered prophecies, were widely known at that time. That's a reference to spiritualism. It was said then that these hidden powers only appeared in certain years. We were young children, small lads, and we decided to conduct an experiment with the heavy oak table which did not contain any iron nails. 
Uh, this story is being told, as I mentioned, around the year 1920. Um, and almost, again, like almost any mention of a sand, so they always are at pains to stress the table does not contain any nails. Um, he continues, we stood around the table, held together by our outstretched hands, such that one person's little finger touched the little finger of each of their neighbors. Of the young lads who participated, I still remember Eliezer of Ram, son of Chaim, Itzik, son of Ancho the Shochet, Chaim Eliezer, son of Yekel Aaron, Shaul Yosef, son of Meir, and Lazar Kolarusek. It was ordained that females participate as well, which had a swift and considerable impact. And given a Hasidic young men at the time were not allowed to have any dealings with young women aside from the Rebbe's children, they, the Rebbe's daughters, Lima Chana and Rezola, and Esterol, the Rebbe's daughter-in-law, if I'm not mistaken, took part. I can clearly recall right away as though it were yesterday, that after around 10 or 15 minutes, one of us called out in an earnest tone, table, table, lift yourself. And one leg of the broad, heavy oak table rose up and then wrapped with the aforementioned leg in response to an assorted number of questions, such as, for example, how old is this person or that person? How many people are standing around the table? How many kreutzers does this person or that person have? To everyone's great amazement, the table gave precise answers to these questions. One member of our party suddenly asked, tell me, O table, I beg of you, when will the Mashiach, the Messiah, come? The table then lowered its leg without offering any answer. This is the truth, which stands to this very day of many youthful, prudent eyewitnesses. Another person among those present was the current Stichina Rebbe, as the son of the Rebbe whose tishroom they're using, who only observed, but did not wish to participate with his hands out of concern for the prohibition against sorcery. This story was told by a well-known Yiddish journalist named Isaac Ewan, Yitzchak Evan, who had a very wide readership around the 1920s in New York. He was well known for writing series of nostalgic memoirs about his Hasidic childhood in the 1860s and 70s in Galicia, which were bestsellers at the time. What's less known is that he also wrote a memoir published in serialized form in the Yiddish daily press called Meine Erfahrungen mit the Spiritualisten, My Experiences with the Spiritualists, um, in which Evan shared with his readers his spiritualist convictions and experiences, both in 1920s New York and also going back to his childhood in Eastern Europe in the 1870s. Um, what I find really remarkable about with the story um, and why I wanted to open with it uh, is, first of all, as we see here that spiritualism is at once taking part in a lot of conventional uh, Jewish tropes, but also subverting them. Um, on the one hand, you have uh, the, the, the seance is taking place around the Rebbe's tish, the Rebbe's table, meaning they're already employing a table that has a particular ritual use um, within the Hasidic uh, world in which the protagonist lived. And also the questions also tie into, or at least the last question, when will the Messiah come, also ties into the traditional Jewish longing for the Messiah and speculation about when the Messiah will come. On the other hand, we also see clear subversions of, tra of traditional norms, starting with gender norms. Um, even though he is at pains to stress that the only girls who participated were ones he already was permitted to know, they're also the only ones, who, they're also the only girls he does know. Um, and I'm sure that even though he did know these young women, he probably was not accustomed to holding their hand around the table. Um, another clear subversion of traditional norm is the fact that they're engaging in this practice that it's unclear whether it's, uh, whether as a, as a religious Jew, whether you're allowed to take part in or, to, to take part or not. Um, and that tension is really expressed in his note about one of the participants there, uh, the son of the Rebbe, who is not comfortable participating because he thinks it's prohibited by the Torah, yet he's also willing, he's not willing to be an active participant, but he, he is willing to be a passive participant, um, which I think sort of goes to show the tension that this is practiced that on the one hand, are we allowed to do it? Are we not allowed to do it? We're not really sure. 
but it's also so alluring the promise of communication with you know with with, with spirits and unseen forces is, is such an attraction it's very hard not to take part um i did not want to mention in brief that spiritualism spread widely across eastern europe um beginning in the late 19th century up until and was very uh widely practiced and discussed and speculated about by Jews in Eastern Europe up until the outbreak of the Holocaust. Um, a very important, to use a, to use a uh, COVID term, an important vector of transmission uh, for knowledge of spiritualism was the Yiddish newspaper, the Yiddish press, which was widely written in Eastern Europe. For example, here's one article called Vos is a Medium, What is a Medium? That was published in the Warsaw Daily Der Moment in 1914. Um, here's, an, here's another example, Vos is dos what is this mediumism? The science of wonder and mystery from a different newspaper explaining to readers um, what spiritualism is and how it works. Um, here's another good example. This is a article called Der Demaskierter Medium, the Unmasked Medium, which is sort of a, a piece critical of spiritualism that is warning readers how to catch a fraudulent medium and you know how to see their tricks that they're doing. Because uh, another point that I uh, did not mention earlier is that spiritualist seance, uh, seances were um, uh, dogged by accusations of fraud. Mediums were constantly accused of fraud and of faking the spirit communication. Um, one factor that contributed to this was the insistence on the, on the part of spiritualists that spiritualist seances had to take place in pitch black darkness um, and often also that people, that it was very important that there be loud background singing, which, which spirituals claim would arouse the spirits and critics would claim would cover up the sound of people shifting things under the table. Um, but this article begins, so this is from 1935 from Countess from Lithuania. You can meet various people from different circles who would gladly partake in a spiritualist seance. This is especially the case in small shtetlich during winter time when the evenings are long and there is nothing to do. Young people sit around a small table and link their hands to call forth spirits who answer various questions. One member of the group is always the leader of the seance, the medium. Um, this article stresses that the spiritualism here is more of sort of a, a, a diversion for people stuck in the small town in wintertime with, you know, it's sort of a form of less of religious practice and more just a, a form of domestic entertainment or some sort of diversion. Um, but one that still might be seen as uh, problematic by some people. Um, I now want to uh, turn to the way that Jews practice uh, spiritualism in Eastern Europe um, in times of crisis. Um, there are many uh, very chilling accounts of people practicing, of Jews in ghettos in the Holocaust, practicing spiritualist seances to try to figure out um, their fate and what the future held for them. Um, a lot of these accounts are found in what are known as Yisker Becher, uh, memorial books that were prepared by uh, either Holocaust survivors or people who had immigrated, uh, who, had, who, who had emigrated from Eastern Europe before the outbreak of World War II. There's this movement to create uh, these memorial books for different Jewish communities in the 1950s and 60s that stopped the 70s and 80s. And there, there, hundreds of books in which former residents of destroyed Jewish communities in Eastern Europe recorded stories and descriptions of daily life and also special events. And that's a very rich source for finding such accounts of uh, seances during the Holocaust. I actually want to speak about a seance during an earlier crisis that's often overshadowed by the Holocaust, which is World War I. Um, for small towns and Eastern Europe, particularly those found along the front and where uh, the borders changed between the different warring uh, forces, um, the local, uh, lo local communities, particularly in the region of uh, Galicia, and which today Poland and Ukraine, um, the Jewish communities were basically totally destroyed. Um, and so this story is from this town of Hrubyshov, uh, which is today found in southeast uh, Poland along the border with Belarus. And the story is told um, is, is in Yiddish, is my translation from a man named Natan Hadas, who was recording in the 1960s, memories from his childhood growing up in World War I in Hrubyshev. 
So he says, in the winter of 1916, there was a typhus outbreak that did not spare a single household. Everyone who had escaped the cholera now fell victim to typhus. The daily funerals instilled fear in everyone. With each passing day, a new seat would open up in the shtibol, in the prayer room, meaning every day someone is dying and now there's a new seat you can take in shul. Uh, it's a very, very chilling description. The Jews saw this as a sign that the footsteps of the Messiah were drawing near, that the words of the prophet were coming true, God forbid, that only one from a town or two from a clan would remain in the war of Gog and Magog. The scholars took to explicating the end of days in the book of Daniel. All sorts of midrashic compendiums and numerical combinations were shown to prove that now was the end of days. Those who sought to hasten the end, the phrase is the older eligible young men who had already spent years learning in the shtibol and were due to continue their studies while being supported by their fathers-in-law, now took up with what was known as spiritualism. They found a table of solid oak, as it says about tefillin, it should be made from one hide that did not contain any iron nails. In order to uphold the verse, do not wield iron over them, meaning the, the altars in the tabernacle. The young men gathered around the table with their hands linked together. They did not utter a word. They did not allow a single thought to pass through their minds other than to concentrate on the table, that it should levitate. After a certain amount of time had passed, the table was supposed to raise itself up on two legs. Then it would need to wrap out answers to all their questions. The most pressing question was, who will win? When will the war end? Things came to an end at around two o'clock in the morning in the alcove of the Trisker Beit Midrash. We, the younger boys, had not been included. The next morning, we learned of the secret. We were so overcome with resentment, meaning that, meaning that they were not included, that we told the adults what had happened. A great argument broke out between two camps. One side demanded that the young men should be expelled from the shtibol, for this was magic, the verse says in Numbers, and there was no divining in Jacob and no magic in Israel, and what they had done was akin to necromancy. The parents of the young men made nothing of it. In any case, they were not expelled because quite a few of the Hasidim were keen to know what the table had said. And the story actually ends without any mention of whether the spirits, of whether there actually was spirit communication or what the table had said. So we're left just sort of wondering what happened. Um, what does the story teach us? Um, I think, first of all, something that's really remarkable about this is the way that spiritualism here emerges as a coping mechanism uh, during the breakdown of, of normal life, whether from the, you know, the, the, the pandemic of typhus and cholera they're experiencing in daily funerals, just something that unfortunately we've experienced in, in our own times, um, to the lack of uh, communication. Um, he mentions elsewhere in the memoir that there used to be a Hasidic rabbi who would come to the town from time to time to answer people's questions, but now the war broken out, the Hasidic rabbi can no longer come. Um, and so spiritualism emerges here as a sort, of, a sort of a source of comfort and a source of higher knowledge or perceived higher knowledge when there is no alternative. Um, what's also fascinating about the story, aside from the fact that it's being held by Hasidic young men in the shtibol, basically in their synagogue and study hall, um, is the fact that in the way the story is told, he mentions here that they took a solid table um, not be, with no nails, not because of, you know, concerned about electromagnetic currents, but because it says in the Torah, you can't wield iron over the Mizbech, over the altar. It says in the Torah that when the altar has to be made of hewn stone without any, uh, that has no metal in it. Um, and similarly, that the, the tefillin uh, factories need to be prepared from a single piece of leather, um, and therefore also has to be made, the table needs to be made from a single piece of wood. So I think this is really fascinating sort of inclusion of spiritualism within uh, Jewish practice here, that the, that the laws that dictate Jewish holy objects, whether tefillin or whether the altar and the tabernacle are now being applied to the implements of uh, spiritualism. Um, and also you have this very interesting tension, again, about whether this is magic or not. And there's a, there's a machloka, there's a dispute and at the bottom line, the people who are permitting it are because they, you know, even they don't necessarily permit it because they think it, 
they don't necessarily permit it because they think you're allowed to do it, but because they want to know what the spirit said. Um, you know, whether it's allowed or whether it's not allowed, it's very compelling and people want to, people want to know what's going on. Um, the time that remains, I, I want to turn to uh, Jewish spiritualism in interwar England. Um, I have an article that's coming out um, in the next uh, few weeks, hopefully, that I wrote with uh, Professor Boaz Hus, who teaches um, in my department at Ben Gurion University on Jewish spiritualism in interwar England. Um, spiritualism, uh, while it had spiritualism um, sort of decreased in popularity in the in the United States following the turn of the, following the turn of the century, but this was not the case in England. Um, and following the mass bereavement experience during World War One, there was actually a tremendous resurgence of uh, interest in spiritualism um, in the interwar period. It's, what's interesting actually is that this was not the case following World War Two. Um, and that British spiritualism more or less comes to an end with the outbreak of World War II. But in the interwar period in England, there are these tremendous number of uh, people engaged in spiritualism. Um, one thing that characterizes British spiritualism in general was that it was very organized. There was over 2000 spiritualist societies active in England at one point around 1930. Um, and there was a spiritualist press and just a very well-organized uh, organizational apparatus, very extensive. Um, another thing that characterized British spiritualism was that there was a strong emphasis on the scientific underpinnings of spiritualism, and that there are all these laboratories for what was called psychical research that these uh, that various uh, scientists and other wealthy individuals, uh, where they would uh, uh, conduct experiments on different mediums. Um, so British Jews took up spiritualism in large numbers. Uh, also following the end of World War I. Um, the first spiritual society in England um, was founded in the East End of London, which was sort of the, the center of East European Jewish immigration to England at the time. It was called the Jewish Spiritual Society. Here we have on the left a uh, news clipping from a uh, spiritualist newspaper called Light. We have the headline, Formation of a Jewish Spiritual Society. And on the right, I, we have a picture of Mr. and Mrs. Tobias and Ethel Blaustein, founders of the Jewish Spiritual Society. Um, and this couple here were actually, um, when they were um, uh, really um, played a crucial role in introducing spiritualism to the Jews of England. Um, just to pause for a moment, I, what led British Jews uh, towards spiritualism? Uh, the first thing that is apparent through reading through the historical material is that for a lot of Jews, taking up spiritualism was a way of assimilating into British culture. Uh, it was something that people took up across all uh, social classes um, and, through, and through engaging in spiritualism it was sort of a way of becoming more British, particularly if you were uh, an immigrant. Um, and um, a lot of British spiritualist societies, while not explicitly Christian only, were often very unfriendly toward Jews, like other uh, societies and clubs at the time. And therefore, there was a felt need to start Jewish spiritual societies in order that Jews would have a comfortable place to pursue this general, um, uh, pra this general British practice. Um, other people turned to, other Jews turned to spiritualism as a way of finding meaning or comfort after bereavement and loss. There's a lot of descriptions of um, of, 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 uh, British, of Jewish British uh, spiritualists who describe losing a spouse or a child um, and that, that sense of loss leading to spiritualism as a way of trying to communicate with their loved one. Um, you, there are also a lot of people who describe being raised in Orthodox households, and none of it really meaning anything to them. Um, and then, you know, the feeling alienated from their own religious tradition, but having a very burning need to... Um, to know that there's something higher out there that you know that 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 there is a soul that the soul survives in the afterlife, and for a lot of British Jews, uh, the traditional answer supplied by Judaism didn't really speak to them, but spiritualism pro, um, pro offered sort of a modern and more rational sounding or scientifically compelling uh, language for speaking about the soul um, and the afterlife and topics like that. Um, and lastly, as I'll show here, a lot of British, a number of uh, Anglo-Jewish spiritualists 
turned to spiritualism in order to bring about what they termed a spiritual revival of Judaism itself. Um, one important organization in this context is the Jewish Society for Psychical Research, which was founded in 1929. Uh, this organization was the most prominent Jewish-British spiritual organization uh, that operated between 1929 and 1937. Um, it actually came about through correspondence to the newspaper, the Jewish Chronicle, which was the most important uh, Jewish newspaper in England at the time. Um, and the organization that was founded, uh, they, they, they um, published in the press their founding uh, constitution of the society, which reads, the society shall be a Jewish association for the purpose of psychic research generally and of its Jewish aspect in particular. It shall be known as the Jewish Society for Psychic Research, or Yisrael. Its objects shall be, A, to seek knowledge of states or conditions existing in the afterlife by means of study, logical evidence, and psychic demonstration. B, to inquire into and adjust any misconception that may surround the object of the society and the beliefs of its members as being opposed to Judaism. C, to offer opportunities for the development of spiritual powers by the formation of groups, e.g. philosophical, experimental or psychic, healing, spiritual development, etc., subject to the sanction of the, of the council, we must earnestly endeavor to exclude quackery and worthless demonstrations. Uh, so in this very interesting document, you see here sort of the, the, the um, three-pronged goals of the Jewish Society for Psychical Research. Uh, which was first was to provide logical evidence for uh, the afterlife, which again is addressing this need for there's a whole generation of people who are being brought up, um, whether in Orthodox homes or being brought up in, in homes that are already less traditional, but you have all these Jews who are feeling very alienated from uh, traditional belief, uh, from the power of tradition to give an answer uh, as to what happens when we die. And spiritualism was seen as providing sort of a substitute for that. Um, and so spiritualism the, um, could, uh, the, 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 the way that uh, one of the members of the society phrases is, 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 says that God and Aiden becomes a reality um, when we know what's coming, when you know what's waiting for us. Um, the second aim is to adjust misconceptions about spiritualism being opposed to Judaism, meaning that they were aware that they were going up against a lot of a uh, traditional precedent that that spiritualism was not compatible with Judaism and they wanted to argue otherwise. And C was to offer opportunities for the development of spiritual power, et cetera, was that if in, in their writings, the members of the society describe how Judaism was once a spiritual religion, but now everything's become material and dry and we've lost our, you know, we've lost our, you know, Judaism's lost its deeper inner, its deeper inner meaning and meaning and its spirit um, and through conducting spiritual seances, we'll be able to uh, re-inject a sense of spirit into Judaism, um, which is interesting to read, interesting to think about, you know, in terms of contemporary um, anxiety about Judaism feeling, you know, dry and, and uh, lacking spirit. Uh, so I want to briefly address what were the attitudes of British rabbis towards the spirituals. Um, I'd like to open with this article from a Reverend M. Bloch, published in 1931 in the Jewish Chronicle, again, the main newspaper of England. Um, he says in his conclusion, the upshot is this, it matters not whether one does or does not believe that it is possible to communicate with the dead. Doesn't, meaning it doesn't matter whether you think it works or not, whether it's real or not. What is important is that every Jew should realize the study and practice of spiritualism or divination or whatever you may wish to call it is, expressed, is expressly forbidden by the Torah and by the sages of the Talmud. No good can possibly come from these pursuits. Much harm may result. It is time, therefore, that the religious leaders should declare that it is wrong to dabble with spiritualism, that only, that only harm and injury can result therefrom, and to lay it down once and for all that the only mediums which are necessary are the prophets and holy men of the Bible who are the authorized and legitimate messengers between heaven and earth. Very strong statement. Spiritualism, not allowed to do it if you're Jewish. Um, and he says earlier in the, in the article that spiritualism falls within the rubric of the practices forbidden by Deuteronomy 18, 10, 11, whether it's 
or Yidoni or inquiring of the dead. Spiritualism falls into, in, 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 into that category, therefore is explicitly forbidden. Also, if you read between the lines of the conclusion here, he says that we have to lay down the only mediums are the prophets and holy men of the Bible, meaning I think there's a sense here that um, spiritualist mediums um, were a threat to the uh, sole authority of the traditional authority figures in Judaism. Um, it's sort of a threat to the hegemony. He doesn't say, you know, rabbis here. He says prophets are holy men of the Bible, but certainly the rabbis, such as himself, are the ones who claim to be continuing their authority. Um, so I think, you know, there's a sense of sort of um, anxiety here about spiritualism being a threat to rabbinic authority, because now you have this other figure who's independent, who's not subject to uh, the rabbis, who claims to be able to communicate with uh, higher dimensions. It's a real threat to their authority. Um, but Reverend Bloch, while expressing himself very strongly, was certainly not the only opinion. Um, this is from, there was a rabbi named Rabbi Alec Ali Silverstone. Um, was an Orthodox rabbi tra uh, trained in the uh, illustrious Manchester Yeshiva. Um, he was the vice president of the Mizrahi Federation, the religious Zionist, the religious Zionist organization of England for many years. Um, and he was also incidentally the um, honorary vice president of the Jewish Society for Psychical Research. Um, in 1932, he published a book called The Great Beyond and Other Essays on Resurrection, Immortality, Spiritualism and Cognate Matters. And he writes here, it is a mistake to assert dogmatically that spiritualism does not deserve any attention at all, that it is beneath consideration. No preconceived notions must debar an unbiased survey of the subject. Progress in science would be impossible if the mind would restrict its field of inquiry and not allow the dislodgement of certain ideas that had become fixed in it. A few words are necessary as to the Jewish attitude to the, to the question of, of whether you can practice spiritualism. These practices, Ov and Yudoni, were forbidden because they were idolatrous. In any case, there is no prohibition against study and investigation for scientific purposes. There need, therefore, be no undue qualms as to the permissibility of interesting oneself in the investigation of spiritualistic phenomena. That the investigation would bear fruit cannot now be doubted in view of the massive evidence already available. Meaning, according to Rabbi Silverstone, the prohibitions against Ovin Yudoni, here he's basing himself on Maimonides, um, they're, pro they're prohibited because they're forms of idol worship. Modern spiritualism, in his understanding, has nothing to do with idol worship, but is rather a form of scientific investigation into hitherto unexplored dimensions of reality. So therefore, there should be no problem whatsoever uh, with participating in this. Um, just to leave time for questions, I'm just going to wrap up now with one last um, rabbinic uh, response to spiritualism, which I think is perhaps the most noteworthy, um, and that is the engagement with spiritualism on the part of the former Chacham, the former Sephardic chief rabbi of England, um, Reverend Dr. Moses Gaster. Um, Gaster was one of the most important Jewish leaders of England, uh, the Balfour Declaration was drafted in his home in London. Um, he was one of the most important uh, early scholars of Jewish studies, um, particularly studying Jewish uh, folklore. Um, he published numerous texts from manuscripts. Um, in short, he was a very, very important figure in Jewish life in England. Um, and in 1932, uh, he was invited by the Jewish Society of Psychical Research to give an address on the spiritual aspect of life according to Jewish teaching. Here on the bottom, in the middle, we have an advertisement for his lecture that was published in the Jewish Chronicle. Um, Gaster um, said at his lecture, according to the news report, um, the idea of communing with the dead or even of conjuring them up for a definitive purpose is not considered contrary to Jewish life in these days. Uh, Gaster says that spiritualism is permitted. Um, one um, qualification is that most, almost all of the reports about Gaster's spiritualist activities are found only in spiritualist sources. Uh, so I have to assume that the spiritualists are, you know, seizing on this as sort of a propaganda opportunity. Um, and even though um, I believe they're true because Gaster never offered any sort of refutation or rebuttal to the claims, so we clearly had no objection to this, this being claimed, but certainly the enthusiastic language um, is 
you know, that's reflecting the part of the spiritualists who are very excited that the rabbis on their side. And it says in the headline here, Judaism on our side, mediumship admitted by brave rabbi. Um, and he says here, um, I was told before I addressed meeting of the Jewish study cycle research that would cause great difficulties for me in religious circles. It did not stop me. I spoke and nothing happened to me. I know the old, that the Old Testament is not opposed to communication between the spirits of the dead and ourselves. This is the person who's writing the article. I listened with great amazement to the words of, the, of this great biblical authority. You see, he went on, the Talmud tells us that most Hebrew texts are capable of 70 different interpretations. Now the rabbis asked, what about the injunction, in, injunction forbidding inquiry of the dead? Oh no, he replied, that is not the correct interpretation. That merely refers to the prohibition of using dead bodies for magical rites. Incidentally, um, there is some truth to what he's saying. If you look in the Shulchan Aruch and Yoradea and Siman Kuf Ayin Tet, um, the, the, uh, it says explicitly that in, according to the opinion of the, of the Ramah, the, Ashk the Ashkenazi ruler, that the prohibition involves using the, you're not allowed to use the body of a dead person to communicate with the dead, but communicating without the body, there's more room to be permissive. Uh, but this was not all. Gaster that same year took part in a, foot, in a spirit photography seance held with the Jewish spirit photographer John Myers in his, in, in his London home on July 10, 1932. On the left here is the, uh, the non-spirit photo. A, a spirit photography was a practice that developed in the 1860s and 70s with the, or, the, with the emergence of spiritualism and also with the emergence of photography. Uh, it was a belief that, that, um, that the photographic exposure could capture the image of spirits who are present in the room but otherwise invisible. Um, this was sort of claim was often, people would claim that, you know, it was really, it was, it was double exposure, it was fraud, um, et cetera, et cetera. Gaster clearly thought it was real. Um, and so on the left, you have the non-spirit photo. And then on the right, you have in the middle, the spirit of, uh, I think it says here, Benjamin, or, of, uh, of uh, Benjamin Disraeli, who he greatly admired, um, is there. In the, is there. Uh, and this, the, this photo was published, I should mention, in spiritualist publications, but not in the Jewish press. Um, it certainly marks out Gaster as uh, by far the most uh, prominent rabbinic supporter of spiritualism. Um, I am going to stop sharing my screen now and pause um, just to uh, conclude, to just summarize what we've seen so far, um, that spiritualism emerged in the 1840s in New York, um, and then spread rapidly, spread rapidly across the globe and was already being practiced by Jews in Eastern Europe by the 1870s. Um, people who practice spiritualism, particularly in traditional Jewish communities in Eastern Europe, often incorporated um, Jewish motifs or Jewish tropes into the spiritualist practice, um, whether it's you know, holding their seance in the, in, the, in the synagogue or things like that. Um, and that spiritualism was often practiced by Jews in times of crisis um, as a coping mechanism um, in a way of, of finding, of, of receiving answers when there was no other source of information. Um, and that J Jewish spiritualism uh, certainly reached its zenith um, in England in the interwar period when there were a number of dedicated Jewish spiritualist societies, such as the Jewish Spiritual Society or the Jewish Society for Psychical Research, um, that issued a number of publications and received um, some degree of rabbinic support, even if not uh, unanimous. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, Sam, thank you so much. Um, we So I, we wanna try to you know end by one so folks can carry on with their days. So we have about 10 minutes for questions. Um, folks can either you know use the, the Zoom function of raising your hand or unmute yourselves and we'll see how that goes. Not a question, but a comment. Uh, love the talk, Sam. Thank you very much for uh, prominent among the British uh, spiritualists, which led to a degree of respectability, was uh, the author of the Sherlock Holmes story, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, and he carried a tremendous reputation. Uh, the other thing I just wanted to mention, Noel Coward wrote 
uh, a delightful play called Blythe Spirit. Uh, and uh, it was made into a movie with um, Rex Harrison and a wonderful character actress called Margaret Rutherford uh, as the, the medium, Madame Arcati. And it's very good fun and readily available on Netflix, uh, Blythe Spirit. Thank you for that, uh, for that recommendation. Um, I also would mention that uh, 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 Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who you just mentioned, um, actually addressed the Jewish spiritual, the Jewish spiritual society it was probably their biggest event in terms of turnout. And he also um, uh, sent remarks to be read at the opening meeting of the Jewish Society of Psychical Research. So his support was actually quite critical to the success of Jewish spiritualist organizations in England. I see there's a question from uh, Matthew. First of all, fascinating lecture, uh, really beautiful research, really appreciate all your work. Um, I'm wondering, have you encountered any intersection with Cardassian spiritism and Jews? Um, so just for those who are not familiar, um, spiritualism took on a number of different um, uh, varieties, of different variants in different countries. And Matthew's question pertains to uh, what the, the way the form that spiritualism took in France where it was known primarily as spiritism. Um, and there was a form uh, developed by a spiritualist leader there named Alain Kardec. Um, and his thought emphasized more, of, there was more of an emphasis on reincarnation. Um, so I have seen very little mention of that, but there are two sources. Um, there are There is a book published in German in 1880 in Budapest by a Jewish scholar uh, uh, from Budapest named Heinrich Ellenberger called, I believe it's called, the book is called something like Kabbalah, Mesmerism, Spiritualism and Revelation or something like that, it's in German. Um, and his understanding of spiritualism is largely of that system. Um, and also there was a, there was a, there was a, a Jewish uh, intellectual, a maskil named Shlomo Rubin who was active in, in Eastern Europe in the latter half 19th century, who ab absolutely detested spiritualism but wrote about it quite often in you know the most negative language. But he also mentions that that figure as well as being you know the person responsible for all the superstition and irrationality, et cetera, et cetera. Great, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Sam, can I ask a question? Sure. Um, okay, so in the first of the seances or whatever we're calling them, it sounded like it was Hasidic boys, right? And I thought that you know amidst all the the war and the disease, that their question was when will this war end? And I was just wondering, I have no knowledge of the history in this area. Are these boys who theoretically would have been drafted into the war? Like, are they asking about literally their own fate or is it more like the collective fate? I think it's both. Um, in that same memoir account, um, the same writer mentions that also there's all, that all sorts of, that in addition to the sciences, that all sorts of fortune telling became very popular in the town. And that one of the reasons for that was that so many family members had relatives who had been drafted and were serving and their fate was unknown. Um, there's actually, there's a really terrific book called, uh, I think it's called The Supernatural War by Owen Davies that is specifically about the rise of um, spiritualism and other occult or esoteric or magical practices during World War I. Um, often in response to this very question of, you know, concern over one's own fate in terms of, you know, their military service or uncertainty about the, you know, the, the, the fate or condition of, you know, a relative who was serving on the front. Um, I have a question. Sure. Um, Sam, thank you. That was really well done. And <laughs> um, Ruth, maybe you can answer this. I have friends who would like to watch a recording. How would they access it? Yes, we will. Um, so we will upload it to our Shoals YouTube channel so, and it takes about 24 hours or so. And then um, I'll make sure that Sam gets the recording and then he can distribute it from there. And it'll be sent, of course, over the OHAVE listserv um, if anyone is on that. And if not, go to ostns.org and you can sign up. Um, okay, so I'll use this as an opportunity, Sam, to thank you once again so very much, which was fascinating, um, to thank everyone for coming. And um, yeah, I mean, I hope we can continue to have more lectures from you because this stuff is super duper cool.
um, and have a great day or night, depending on what time zone you are on. And uh, see you all later. Thank you very much, uh, Mara Ruth, for, for uh, hosting and the invitation. And look forward to continuing the conversation with all those interested. Awesome. Bye, everyone.